True, nervous. Very, very dreadfully nervous I had been, and am. But why will you say that I am mad? senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing the key. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthy, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object there was none. Passion there was none. I love the old man. He had never wronged me, he had never given me insult. For his gold I had no desire. Ready the carriage for our journey. Very well, sir. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. One of his eyes resembled that of a vulture. A pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what caution with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. Will there be anything else, sir? No, my boy. That will be all for tonight. Very well, sir. Every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it, oh, so gently. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, 
I put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed, so that no light shone out. And then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. <laughs> would a madman have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern, cautiously. Oh, so cautiously. Cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. But I found the eye always closed. And so, it was impossible for me to do the work. It was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. Good morning, sir. Did you sleep well? Every morning, when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he had passed the night. So you see... Here you are, sir. He would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked upon him while he slept, until the eighth night. cautious in opening the door on this night. The watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before this night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph. To think that there I was, opening the door, little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret <laughs> deeds or thoughts. His room was as black as pitch, and his vision was poor, so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door. I kept pushing it on steadily. Steadily. I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour I did not move a muscle, and in the meantime, I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed, listening, just as I have done, night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. I knew this groan. It was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief. 
Oh no, it was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night just to think of it, when all the world sunk, it has welled up from my bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. since the first slight noise when he had turned in the bed. His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, It is nothing but the wind in the chimney, or it is only a mouse crossing the floor, or it is merely a cricket making a single chirp. Yes, he had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he had found all in vain. All in vain, because death in approaching had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within his room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern. You cannot imagine how stealthily I opened the lantern until it lay. A single dim ray, like the thread of a spider, shot out of the crevice and fell full on the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow of my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I directed the ray as if by instinct, precisely on the damned spot. And now, have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over acuteness of the senses? Now I say, there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates the soul to its courage. But even yet, I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. Do you mark me well? And now, at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet for some minutes longer I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder, louder, and I thought the heart must burst. And now a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. sound. This, however, did not vex me, 
it would not be heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The old man was dead. There was no pulsation. He was stone, stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If you still think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned, and I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I then took up three planks from the flooring and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the board so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatever. I had been too wary for that. The tub had caught all. Sorry to bother you this late, sir. I'm Officer Brown, this is Officer O'Reilly, and Officer Clement. Good evening, officers. How may I help you? Well, a shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play has been aroused. Information was logged at the police office, and we've been deputed to come and search the premises. Yeah, may we come in, sir? Yes, yes, please, of course, come in. Again, we're sorry to be here this late, sir. About this shriek... Yes, the shriek. I, I must apologize. It was my own. I, I was awakened from a horrible nightmare and must have been louder than I thought. These things happen. May we speak with the master of the house? Oh, unfortunately, you cannot. You see, he, he, he went away to the country just yesterday to visit some family, and I'm afraid he will not return for at least two weeks. I see. Well... Since you're awake, would you mind showing us around the house? No, no, not at all. Please, follow me. Please, Jack. Right this way. Ah! And 
and uh, this is the master's chamber. Shall I, shall I show you his treasure? That won't be necessary. It's obvious this is all just a big misunderstanding. Very well. May I offer you gentlemen something to drink before returning to duty? Very good. After you, please. That ought to keep you warm. They keep doing this to us, you know. Working us all through the night. We really don't do much, you know. <laughs> yes. Do you remember what's happened last week? Mm. Nobody tells that story like Clement here. Another bad storm, just like this. Mean O'Reilly, blaster, come right off the job. Get the call in. Go pick up these two goons. Try and rob a jewelry store. Next thing I know, O'Reilly's passed out, and I'm dragging his ass to the sewers. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, time does move forward, as they say, huh? <laughs> Oh, it could be. Yeah, early development of a story. Uh, well, it is, it is getting rather late and all. Well, it is a shame to keep you out this late, gentlemen. <laughs> No. <laughs> oh my god. No. No. They heard. They suspect. They know. They're making a mockery of my heart. Their hypocritical smiles. I can bear this agony no longer. Here, here is the beating of his hideous heart. <laughs>